Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 338th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a new Ceratopsian from New Mexico, which is the oldest of its group, but it's kind of a specific group. So the more interesting thing is just the details of the new species. We also have an interview with Mariana Di Giacomo, who is the natural history conservator at the Yale Peabody Museum, which is undergoing some huge renovations, which is mostly what we talk about. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see it someday. Yeah, including like some really cool new mounts for their dinosaurs and stuff. It's going to be great. And we have dinosaur of the day, Cediosaurus, because Sabrina can't go an episode without a sauropod. Somebody requested that one. (laughs) That's true. There have been a lot of sauropod requests. I can't help if a lot of people want to hear about the sauropods. Yeah. You also requested a sauropod for this episode, but I didn't have access to the paper. So that's not in here yet. (laughs) (laughs) And then I also just want to mention Happy World Metrology Day. Of course. May 20th, the anniversary of the Meter Convention from 1875 which is an important day because meters are great, as well as all the other SI units. They make all the engineering and science much easier to handle than using a bunch of different units. So I have a fun fact about that, which relates to dinosaurs. So I think it's interesting, hopefully, to you also. (laughs) (laughs) But before we get into all that, real quick, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we want to thank Diplotocate, Sophie, Ewan, Pippa Ceratops, Neil Ovenator, Elizabeth, the Georges family, Sarasaurus Rex, Kessler, and Ben at Jurassic Site B. Yeah, thank you so much. We appreciate all of your support. And I know I've said it before, but I mean it each time. Like Your support keeps this show going. Definitely. And one of the really cool things, if you join our community of dinosaur enthusiasts, is, of course, our Discord channel. And we want to thank our patrons who recently got to see some of the cool new things at the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum in Winton. Oh, yeah. It's like brand new, or at least part of it is. Mm -hmm. We actually had a few listeners who've been there and got to see the March of the Titanosaurs, which sounds amazing. More sauropods. Oh, yeah. (laughs) There's a big trackway, I think, is one of the hallmark pieces, right? They shipped it over from the Lark Quarry, I think it's called, that we actually didn't get a chance to make because it's like way out in the boonies. It's hard to get to, like you can't drive a rental car there. I was afraid it was going to shake apart. So now you can get there easier by going to Winton. Still a little bit out of the way, but at least there are paved roads to it. And some really awesome new giant titanosaur sculptures to go along with it. Yeah, thank you to everyone who shares all sorts of stuff in that Discord server because it's like my favorite place to go. It really makes me happy. I often go there as I'm like falling asleep to see a little (laughs) bit of dinosaur stuff before I go to sleep, clear my head. And in a happy place. It's very nice. It is a happy place. And if you want to join our community, join us in our happy place, then <laughs> <laughs> sign up at our Patreon, patreon.com slash Inodino. So jumping into the news, we're going to kick it off with our new dinosaur, as we usually do. This week, it is a Ceratopsian, like I mentioned before, written by Sebastian Dahlman and others and published in Pale Z or Pal Z. It's a German translation, so I'm not going to say what the Z stands for. But this new ceratops is really cool. It's from the Menifee Formation, which is in northwest New Mexico. It was actually described back in 1997 in a review of the Allison member of the Menifee Formation. It was one of those sort of like overviews of like all the stuff we found there. And they talked about a ceratopsian, but they didn't give it a name as a new genus or species at the time. I don't even think they identified what it was. I think they just gave it a specimen number mm. and just sort of talked about that it was there. So they, they knew there were interesting bones, but they hadn't prepared it yet, maybe. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's important because it is older than some of the other ceratopsian formations, especially for this type of ceratopsian. So it's worth mentioning, even if you don't know the genus yet, And it might also be because it wasn't fully prepared at the time, so they might not have had the time to get it fully ready for a new name. But that has recently been finished. And now that it's prepped out, we can see some new unique features. So the new Ceratopsian is named Menifee Ceratops Celii. And Menifee Ceratops is obviously from the Menifee Formation and Ceratops, which is Greek for horned face. So it's the Menifee Formation horned face. 
doesn't really make sense when you translate it, but it, Menephyseratops is a pretty good name. And then Celii is after Paul Seely, who was the guy that originally found the dinosaur back in, I think, the 90s, presumably, since it was published in 97. Yeah, probably. Menephyseratops is a centrosaurine, and usually the way I describe that is it's the group that includes Styracosaurus. They often have a big central horn on their nose, smaller brow horns, if any at all, and big decorative frills, or really small decorative frills relative to the other group, which is Chasmosaurines. That includes Triceratops, and that's sort of the prototypical chasmosaurine big brow horns smaller nose horn big old frill but less ornamentation on the frill it's usually how it goes but there are a ton of exceptions there's a lot of crossover and convergent evolution and mixing up that happens and that's definitely the case with this centrosaurine it's not a typical centrosaurine and the paper does include some really nice paleo art which is always the easiest way to get a view of what the animal looks like rather than trying to piece it together from different bones and maybe a silhouette. Plus you get nice colors. Yeah. it's a, yeah. The, the colors they choose are always interesting. Not the most scientifically important, I guess, because it's always just sort of a, a guess. Well, not always. Usually a guess. <laughs> In this case, it was a guess. I think they made it sort of a greenish color, if I remember right. It's a very pretty piece of paleo art. The first thing you'd notice if you're thinking about, oh, it's a centrosaur, is that it doesn't have any central nasal horn like I expected. It's all about the frills. In this case, yes, but even the frill is significantly less ornamented than some of the others. Is that because it's older? Maybe. It is older in geological age, but I don't know how old it was as an individual. They think that it might have been 4 meters or 13 feet long at its full size, which is kind of small for a ceratopsian, at least compared to something like Triceratops. And I think the estimate for this one was less than that. I think it was three point something. So I'm assuming they think it was a subadult, but I don't remember reading that specifically in the paper. This is based on some side comments elsewhere. So yeah, maybe it's because it's older geologically, or it could be because it's younger as an individual, because a lot of times as animals get older, they grow more elaborate horns or decorations on their frills in the case of ceratopsians sometimes although triceratops got like less decorated frill it's all over the place so it's really hard to say with just one individual but with menifee ceratops even though it doesn't have that nasal horn it has sort of a more parrot-like beak i would say sort of like a protoceratops that's what i always think that was the first ceratopsian i saw that had that sort of beaky parrot face thing going on without any horns on the nose parrot face (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's really like yeah the whole face because even though we call it a parrot beak the beak is really only like the tip of the snout and in this case it's like the whole snout of the ceratopsian is all parody looking but in the case of menifee ceratops that whole parrot shaped beak is mostly just inferred from relatives because we didn't find the top of the snout. So we can't really be certain that it didn't have a little bit of a nasal horn or a nasal boss or something like Pachyrhinosaurus or something. But we do have a little bit of the side of the snout and we have a lot of other elements of the skull so we know what its close relatives are. And those ones have this more parrot-like beak without a nasal horn. So that's our best guess. Although this one is like seven or eight million years younger than those. So maybe that's the case, but we can't be certain. It does have, though, a more decorative frill than something like Triceratops. It's got six triangular ornaments on the top of its frill, three on each side. So if you hold up like three, the number three, <laughs> and you put it like at As the back Garrett of your head. As Garrett is right now. Yep. <laughs> sort of like you're wearing a crown, I guess. That's sort of the equivalent of what it has. Or two mini crowns. Yeah, two. They're just like separated by a little bit because everything is symmetrical down that center line. So there's a little bit of a gap in the middle and there's three bumps basically on the top. There isn't really anything on the sides. It's a lot smoother on the sides without much ornamentation there. I think it actually looks pretty nice, pretty nice little ornaments. And I think other Menifeeceratops probably also thought it looked nice since it's essentially the whole point of these frill ornamentations. But it also has two brow horns, which is a little bit weird because it's a centrosaur and usually they don't have big brow horns. These aren't as big as something like a triceratops, but they're reasonably large and they curve forward a little bit. So I think it looks 
kind of similar to Xenoceratops with a less decorated frill. That's the closest well-known Ceratopsian or the most well-known Ceratopsian that has this sort of general look. Do you remember Xenoceratops? It's got a whole lot going on. (laughs) This is like a simpler version of Xenoceratops is kind of how I think about it. A little bit like Ava Ceratops too, but that one's a pretty small one. So it's like a larger version of that. Anyway, you can just think of these three or to six, depending on if you're talking about one side or both sides, ornaments on the top of the frill, front curving horns, and no nasal horn with a parrot-like beak, and you get a pretty good idea of how it looked. The find is really good, in my opinion, because it also includes, in addition to partial bits of the skull, quite a bit of the body of Menifeceratops. So the head has edges of the frill, pieces of horn, a complete left jaw, and a small piece of the upper jaw, or like in the maxilla sort of side of the snout area, which is useful, and that's really all they used for naming, for diagnosing Menifeceratops as a new species, because it's like ankylosaurs, where usually we don't find the body, and we have all these unique things to go by on the head, so you just kind of ignore the body because with most of them, you don't have anything to compare. So there isn't anything you can say is unique to it because it's so uncommon to find any of it. And it usually comes down to the frills and the horns. Yeah, exactly. For ceratopsians. Definitely. And actually in ankylosaurs too, it's sort of the horns in the back of the head. Mm. And then like in ankylosaurs, it's, it's like the bony plates on top of the head. Whereas I guess ceratopsians have like these cheek projections and some other elements like horns on the top of the head too. But they did find a lot of the body, so I think it's super cool. It definitely makes for a better mount, if nothing else. They got lots of vertebrae, 16 total, for two from the neck, eight from the back, and six from the sacrum, which is a lot. That's a lot of sacral vertebrae, six. Yeah. Might be common for centrosaurs. I never know what ceratopsians have in their body because everyone's always just talking about the skull, but six sacral vertebrae, quite a few. They also found the left ilium, which is the upper hip bone to go along with that sacrum. They found 11 ribs, a complete femur, and fragments of other limb bones, including pieces of the ilium, radius, ulna, and a metatarsal. It's pretty decent. Yeah, that is. Especially with the femur, you know, you can get, get some good estimates on height and weight and maybe stride and things like that when you have those types of bones. As far as the unique features go that made Menifeceratops Menifeceratops and not just some other undiagnosed ceratopsian or within some other genus the main thing is those three epiossifications on the top of each half of the frill and the lack of them elsewhere so the smooth sides of the frill there's also a shape of the indent at the bottom of the frill which is sort of like before a cheek horn thing going on that a lot of ceratopsian have if you look at like the back of the frill sometimes there's a little bit of an indent at the bottom and the frill sticks back out but it's like also sort of the cheek. It's this weird thing that they have. Anyway, it's got a unique shape around that. And then there's also the size and the shape of the brow horns with their medium length curving forward and down a little bit, which helps to identify it too. And a lot of other little subtle things like ridges on the nasal bones and all sorts of things that you don't notice unless you're up close looking at the fossil. But I was right. The main things were the frills and the horns. Yeah, definitely. I think they used some of these specific ridges to figure out that it was a centrosaurine rather than just a general neoceratopsian. But even though those things might be phylogenetically kind of important, they're not super useful in identifying it as a unique species. So like I mentioned, it is a new record for the oldest centrosaurine ceratopsian, which is pretty specific, although not that specific as centrosaurine does have a decent number of species in it. This is based on it being from the lower Allison member of the Menifee Formation, which, as the authors put it, is from the late early Campanian, (laughs) or in normal English, 83 and a half to 80 million years ago, which is pretty old. I was actually surprised that that was the oldest centrosaurine. I haven't looked at the dates of centrosaurines, but there are all sorts of ceratopsians that are older than that. That's not really old for a ceratopsian in general. For example, Zuni ceratops is at least 90 million years old, 10 million years older, basically. And superficially, Zuni ceratops looks fairly similar to Menifee ceratops too. So it's not like this is the first ceratopsian that has like some feature. And you'd be like, oh, that's the first time we've ever seen something with the two big brow horns or something. It doesn't check any of those boxes. 
But phylogenetically, it is still pretty important because it could mean that Centrus RNA evolved in southern Laramidia and later moved north, which is the kind of stuff paleontologists want to know. Mm -hmm. And unlike some cases where we're trying to guess at what the earliest things are in an area, we actually have a pretty good sample of Centrus RNA all the way down to Mexico and up to Alberta with Alberta ceratops. And for once, we also have decent evidence of absence since we have 80 million year old rocks without centrosaurines from northern Laramidia, like Alberta. So they probably disappeared? Well, they probably weren't there yet. They probably evolved in southern Laramidia and then worked their way up oh, north. Oh, right, right. At least that's what we're thinking. Could be that they disappeared. They could have evolved up there, made it their way down south, and then disappeared in northern and then had to re-migrate back up. Like, human evolution had a lot of those sorts of crazy movements all over the place, so definitely possible. The closest relatives of Menifee ceratops are Crittenden ceratops and Yeueka ceratops, and those three, along with an unnamed ceratopsian, are together in their own little outgroup of basal centrosaurines. They're all expected to have those sort of parrot-like beaks front curving brow horns, and medium-sized frills, but Menifee ceratops is the only one with pretty smooth sides of the frill rather than ornaments also continuing down the sides of the frills. And it's way earlier because Menifee ceratops is about 80 million years old, whereas Crittenden ceratops is about 73 million years old, and Yeuaka ceratops is about 72 million years old. Plus, Menifee ceratops is the only one from New Mexico and this formation in general, Crittenden ceratops is from Arizona, and yet Ueka ceratops is quite a bit farther to the southeast in Coahuila, Mexico. Although, of course, dinosaurs did not care about our arbitrary lines of states and countries. <laughs> nope. Only geological boundaries. Exactly. Like, they cared a lot about that western interior seaway, which put them in Laramidia. But other than that, probably not so much. But of course, as the authors always like to point out, we still need more fossils. Because these earlier, smaller ceratopsians are largely known from partial skulls rather than complete skulls, like we seem to find all the time for triceratops. <laughs> so hopefully we can find some more Menifee ceratops in the rocks and get a better picture of what it looked like. Find out if it really didn't have a nasal horn and had that parody beak. Are there more to those frills than we know? It's true. We got a decent smattering of the edge of the frill, but we are missing some pieces. It's a pretty one, though. I like it. So now that you've talked about a ceratopsian, I've got a quick sauropodomorpha <laughs> piece of news. So of course you do. I can't help it if these things come up so frequently. <laughs> <laughs> so in Lufeng, Yunnan province in China, researchers recently found the skeleton of a three-year-old individual sauropodomorph dinosaur. It's probably a new species, but there's no paper on it yet. They found part of the skull, cervical vertebra, dorsal vertebra, and metacarpal bone. And they're estimating that this individual was five and a half feet or 1.7 meters long. And it lived in the early Jurassic. So being a sauropodomorph, it was herbivorous with leaf-shaped teeth. I was just realizing how opposite sauropods are from ceratopsians, where we found over a dozen vertebrae from Menifee ceratops. And it's basically like, well, those are interesting, but we're not going to use them for much of anything. Whereas with the sauropods, it's like the, the vertebrae are where it's at. There's no skull, but if you found the skull, it wouldn't be all that useful. We're all about the, the vertebrae because that's mm -hmm. what we usually find. Yeah, that's true. Also femurs, I think. Yeah, that's true. There are, there are definitely other bones that are useful. That's a pretty tiny one, though. Five and a half feet. It's only three years old. Maybe that's not so small for a three-year-old then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'll go back to the ceratopsians now. I see. <laughs> just had to sneak a sauropod in as early as possible. Well, that's because this one is about a ceratopsian at a museum, and I like to keep my museum segments together. Gotcha. Yeah. So this one's about headless Henry the Triceratops, who's going to be complete by mid-June. Meaning completely prepared? Yeah. And Headless Henry's at the Missouri Institute of Natural Science and is the largest Triceratops found and the only mounted dinosaur in Missouri. Cool. And Henry came to this museum in 2013 as just a jumble of bones that was found in Wyoming. And they've been working on 
assembling Henry since, and they're now using 3D printing to help build Henry. That's what's going to speed up this whole process. As last year, they had one volunteer, Daniel Orr, who started working with Dr. Henry Sai from Missouri State, and they started this new 3D printing approach. And this volunteer, Daniel, bought six 3D printers that are now printing 24-7. And there's also a 3D printer in the museum that keeps churning out pieces of Henry. Wow. So it's it's more like in June it will be done being printed. I, I assume, actually, that they've probably finished preparing it a while back if they've already scanned it and started printing. Oh, yes. It, by complete, I mean assembled. Gotcha. It took them 2,000 hours to print the lower jaw. They got some pretty massive lower jaws Mm -hmm. and really cool teeth mashed in there. So, Yeah, and they're using super glue to keep the parts together. They used four gallons in the (laughs) left femur alone. That's a lot of glue. Yeah, and they're also 3D printing small models of Henry to help them figure out how to pose the triceratops. Cool. So next, I just heard about a 100% virtual museum. of It's the Museum of the Patagonian Desert of Anielo. And it's virtual, so anybody can visit it digitally, and they've got tours of their main attractions. So I first saw a video preview, and that reminded me of a VR experience. The exhibits are a little bit interactive. You've got this dinosaur on display, and it's roaring. And then I tried it out, and it reminded me more of a non-VR video game, where you're kind of clicking around, and you're moving. It's got soothing music as you explore the exhibits. It's all laid out like a museum, so it's pretty fun. Is it kind of like doing a virtual tour of a house or something where you're just clicking around like Street View? It felt a little more interactive than that. Could you take like smaller steps maybe? You take smaller steps, things are moving, there's actually uh, like placards with explanations of the displays. Cool. Yeah. Is this a real place as well? Yes. Okay. (laughs) When you said it was a digital museum, I was thinking that it didn't actually exist in real life, but that's cool. I think it exists in real life. Well, it looks like pictures of real things. It's not like Google Street View that way. It's not pictures. It's all completely animated. Oh, interesting. I'm going to check this out. Yeah, it was pretty fun to try out. So next in San Antonio, Texas, their dinosaur mascot, which is known as Arky, Arky is an acrocanthosaurus at the Witt Museum, recently got, quote-unquote, vaccinated. Arky sits outside the admin offices, and there's a photo of Arky with a large bandage on its arm and a sticker that that says, I got my COVID-19 vaccine. A couple million years too late, though. Well, yeah. It's not going to do much for Arky. Arky wouldn't have needed to worry about it, I suppose. Yeah, probably not, actually. I don't know how much it affects birds. Also didn't exist when Arky lived. That's a good point, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it would be like COVID negative 66 million. Yeah. In Kalamazoo, Western Michigan University has a free dinosaur park on campus. They've got five life-size dinosaur statues. It's Triceratops, Stegosaurus, Velociraptor, Spinosaurus, and Parasaurolophus. And each of them has a sign with facts about the dinosaur. Things like you know how fast they moved, what they ate, when they lived. And their plan is to add more dinosaurs and dinosaur footprints, make it an even bigger free dinosaur park. Free is nice. Mm Mm-hmm. In Florida, Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden in Coral Gables has a new exhibit called Jurassic Garden, a Prehistoric Adventure. (laughs) Cool. Yeah. So this garden's 83 acres, and the Jurassic Garden hosts walking tours to teach visitors about their life-size dinosaurs that are on display. And it's open from now until July 18th. And based on the pictures, I could see Parasaurolophus, T-Rex, and some feathered raptors. I like the feathers. Mm-hmm. I'm always impressed when they put feathers on outdoor dinosaur displays. Oh, I will say these look like fiberglass. Sculpted feathers, yeah. not like fluffy feathers? Yes. Gotcha. Still better than the lizardy scales. Yeah. In Minnesota, in Champlain, there's a Sinclair gas station that's known for its I think it's pronounced Dino the Dinosaur, because why would it be Dino the Dinosaur? Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) So Dino's been in front of the gas station for 20 years, and every other week, Dino gets a new costume. That's because Diana Merkel, the office manager, 
knit Dino a scarf one winter and people liked it so much. So so since then, she's given Dino a hundred different looks. Oh, man. That is a lot of costumes. I know. Most of them are to celebrate different holidays. They got like July 4th, Halloween, New Year's, Mardi Gras, Mother's Day. I wonder what a Mother's Day costume looks like. So that was the picture or one of the pictures in the article I found. At least I, well, actually, I don't know if it was for Mother's Day. There's one picture of it in a tuxedo, but maybe that one wasn't for Mother's Day. That seems like a New Year's sort of costume. That could be. Oh, for Mother's Day, it's got flowers on its head. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah, that makes some sense. Maybe Dino's female. Maybe. And there's a sign behind Dino that says, Happy Mother's Day, wanted babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> so Dino's the baby in this case? Uh, it's unclear. Okay. <laughs> and apparently the community's gotten really into it. People chip in with wigs and hacks and leftover costumes. Something good to do with your Halloween costume when you're done with it. Mm -hmm. Repurpose it into a dinosaur costume. Yeah. So in media news, there's this K-pop group, NCT Dream, and the people who made the kids song Baby Shark, which I know that song from TikTok personally, but anyway... They have a new dinosaur song called Dinosaurs A to Z, and they sing about dinosaurs for each letter. Ooh. Yeah. We tried doing that in an interview once. We were listing off dinosaurs that start with every alphabetical letter. Some are really easy. Some are much more difficult. Yes. In the music video, they have a lot of animated dinosaurs in it, you know, for each one they name. And that was made by this company, Pinkfong, that made a whole album of dinosaur songs. Which I'd be curious what the other songs sound like and if they're meant for children or also adults. I don't know. I'd be willing to bet that they're for kids. Yeah, it's usually where they go with dinosaur songs. Sometimes they get remixed. That's true. <laughs> and then another just kind of crazy thing I read was that that K-pop group has 23 people in it, which I didn't realize groups could get that big. That is a lot. That's almost enough for every letter in the alphabet. They could all dress up as the different dinosaurs and act out the whole song. That was my thought. <laughs> they just need three volunteers from the audience <laughs> or like their manager or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the last item I found was that the show Rugrats is getting a reboot starting May 27th. What does this have to do with dinosaurs? Because the trailer shows all the babies getting chased by a T-Rex. But it wasn't Reptar. I was sad about that. Well, Reptar isn't really a T-Rex. Isn't Reptar like a Godzilla thing? I think Reptar is, is a mix of things. Okay. But Reptar is supposed to be a dinosaur. I prefer a real T-Rex to a Reptar. Yeah. But you'd rather see Reptar? I nostalgia. It seems like they're all going on a lot more adventures than they did in the original version. I would guess it's in their imagination because... How would these babies? <laughs> well, this is like those weird movies where it's like a baby on its own, like crawling around a major city, time boss baby or whatever. And time travel somehow. Yeah. And now we're going to go on to our interview with Mariana Di Giacomo. But of course, as always, we have an extended cut of this because there's so much to talk about when it comes to dinosaur museums especially one as massive as the LP Body Museum. Mm -hmm. So if you're a patron and you want to listen to a longer version, check out your premium content feed. We are joined this week by Mariana De Giacomo, who is a paleontologist and natural history conservator at the Yale Peabody Museum. She has a PhD from the University of Delaware's Preservation Studies Program, and she was a fellow at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. Did I hit all of the highlights of your career so far? Yes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so you haven't really been at Yale all that long, but you're already doing some like really massive work there, it sounds like. Well, the whole reconstruction. <laughs> yeah. Is that why you ended up at Yale? Yes and no. The reason why Yale needed a conservator was because the previous one retired. And so they um, were looking for a natural history conservator. And I was very lucky that I was finishing my PhD kind of at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I was also in the job search. So it, it was so perfect uh, that those things kind of aligned. 
So what does it mean to be a conservador? Because I think usually we end up talking about people who like go on digs or... Or do prep work. Prep, mm. um, I used to do all those things in my previous life. <laughs> <laughs> um, but nowadays what I do is I take care of specimens in general. So I take care of dinosaurs, of course. But I also take care of the collections of anthropology and entomology and mineralogy. My role in the museum is to preserve the collections into the future so that both researchers and the general public can continue to use them and enjoy them. Cool. So it's like the last and the longest step of paleontology, it sounds like. Well, it's interesting because a lot of the, of the conservation work starts in the field with the choice of adhesives that you do, and then it goes into the prep lab, again, with adhesives and certain tools, and then it goes into the collection with the housing that you use for those specimens. And so I think conservation is present throughout the life of the fossil, but it sometimes it's, it's not called conservation, if you must. Gotcha. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, because I know... I've, we've heard all these stories about people in the early days of paleontology and like using adhesives that were actually really bad or like painting things in ways. What, at the time, you know, it was the best we could do or the best that we knew of. But I didn't think about that. Yeah, that that's actually an important step in the conservatorship. Is that what it's called? Is that a different thing? Well, we call it conservation in conservation. general. Uh, yeah. Cool. So I also, <laughs> I noticed on your LinkedIn profile, too, it's like a picture of you brushing. What is it like a cheetah? sculpture oh yes we uh it's actually taxidermy we uh received a donation and i had to go over there and do some cleaning before the specimens came into the museum which is another thing that i do as well mm -hmm. cool so it's not just conserving fossils it's also like all of the replicas does it include the mural that is so famous oh yes it does <laughs> yes i am actually having a lot of fun with with that because I am one of the very few people who can access the mural today. And it is part of my job to make sure that that mural is protected throughout the construction. Cool. Yeah. So what does it mean? Like, what are you doing to protect it? We have this amazing scaffold that Turner Construction built for us. And... It's, you know, the mural is huge, yeah. mm -hmm. so it has two levels. So we go up the stairs and I can walk the mural uh, in one level and then I can go up another five stairs and monitor it on a second level. We also have, so this scaffold is not a traditional scaffold, if you must, it's, it's enclosed. So right now it has its own air circulation so that no air with dust hmm. can get inside that space. We also have uh, conditioned air so that the temperature and relative humidity are also going to be kept stable during construction. It doesn't matter if anywhere else in the museum they need to, I don't know, knock a wall and then it's summer and it's very hot or it's winter and it's extremely dry and cold. We will have uh, a separate environment for both murals. And as well, it has security and the light levels are also reduced so that we're giving them a little bit of a break during construction. And it has a little switch that I go in and I flip the switch and I can see everything for, for monitoring during, during these weird times that this mural <laughs> is living. Wow, that is an, an really impressive. I was imagining a plastic sheet covering it that is a whole other level <laughs> yep that's really cool yeah i guess the dust would be the big thing so it probably has like positive air pressure to like keep all the air from leaking in and stuff so we're letting air come in but it's filtered mm. and it's uh conditioned so it's not just any air let's say <laughs> only the best air for the mural best air <laughs> <laughs> Cool. And then this whole, did this project start? I saw like slightly different numbers, different places. Somewhere it said that it started in October, but somewhere else it kind of seemed like the construction part didn't start until recently. But what was the timing like so far? So on January 2nd of 2020, 
we had closed, well, we closed it December 31st, but January 2nd, 2020, we started the dismantling of the fossil halls. So the rest of the museum was open then, but the fossil halls were closed. And that's when we started working with Research Casting International to dismantle some of these skeletons. And some of them went to Canada for some work that they need to do to bring them back to the museum, looking like science tells us today these skeletons looked. Well, the dinosaurs, not just the skeletons, but we're not going to cover them in flesh. <laughs> uh, and... During that time, we were working in dismantling both halls. And like I said, the museum was still open, but then COVID hit and we had to close our doors. The museum stays open in a way uh, virtually. So we have a lot of social media and there's the Peabody Evolved website and we have a lot of activities that are still happening but the galleries themselves are closed. The goal was to close the galleries in June, but we had to do that earlier. And the construction company has been working in other places outside the Peabody building, but it's like the Peabody complex, let's call it. Even though it's not the building itself, they have been working in other places because we're getting collection areas renovated as well. Oh, wow. So that we can move the collections that are in the Peabody into those spaces while the Peabody gets renovated. So we need to empty the building, which is happening as we speak. Wow. And we need to empty everything so that the construction company can start doing actual construction inside the Peabody building. So is that where that picture I saw on Twitter of... I think it's fossilized footprints that are sort of like quote unquote, behind a wall, but they're really sort of behind bars, behind some racks, I think. <laughs> yes. So those, those are absolutely amazing. They are in this sort of base that we knew that they were there. Everybody knew that they were there. Uh, and you, they are on both sides of the wall because they are separating two collection spaces. Mm -hmm. And on the one side, it was a vertebrate paleontology collection room, and you could see the prints. But on the other side, there was an anthropology room, and they had put all cabinets in front. <laughs> we don't even know when, because nobody alive has seen that side. So this happened years and years and years ago, and that room was packed with anthropology collections. It wasn't just, oh, yeah, just move that cabinet and we can peek at them. There's no way. <laughs> Um, and so when that anthropology room got emptied and we worked with the construction company to take down the old cabinets, we were just marveled at the beauty of those tracks that, again, everybody knew they were there. They were not inside a wall, for example, mm -hmm. that, you know, now all of a sudden we have to be careful of all the walls because we have <laughs> things inside them. That's not the case. <laughs> We knew that they were there. It's just that we couldn't get to them mm -hmm. because all these cabinets filled with beautiful objects were in front. Wow. That's quite a story. Yeah. So where they took all the stuff out of these rooms and put them off into some other building so you could upgrade the rooms down there? A lot of the anthropology collections are now getting integrated into a new collection space that is at Yale West Campus. Okay. So we have this offsite facility that has this amazingly beautiful new storage space. It's dreamy how gorgeous <laughs> it is. And all those anthropology collections are getting installed in their brand new cabinets. And the vast majority of the anthropology collections are not going to go back to the Peabody. We will have some but not all of them. The goal is that we will have a lot of them at West Campus so that it's, it's a beautiful place where any researcher that needs to uh, find those collections can go and browse these beautiful cabinets and find interesting topics to, to discuss. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. What's going to fill that anthropology space that is now going to be vacated? So everything is getting renovated. In, in the Peabody. So that space was in the basement is now going to be turned into, I think there's going to be a lab and there's going to be 
a library space, if I'm not mistaken. But things are going to be moved around. So not all the spaces will look the same. And I think the most exciting aspect of our renovation is that we're going to have more spaces for education. So we will have more classrooms and more places for the public to experience the specimens and all the knowledge and science that live in that building. And also we will have a 50% more exhibit space. So we will have more space to show people the amazing collections that we have. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really cool. I had just imagined like you're going to move the stuff out, you're going to put in fancy new racks, and then you put everything back into those racks, but it sounds way, way more complicated it than that. It is more involved. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so are there any big changes outside of the mural and like the arrangement of things? Is there anything Research Casting is doing that you're excited about? That you can share? <laughs> yeah, sure. They are repositioning the skeletons. So they are closer to what science tells us that these dinosaurs looked like before we had our skeletons you know dragging their tails and so that's going to change the the position is going to be a little bit more lifelike as well so that we are very very excited to to see the work that research casting international is doing to to bring these these dinosaurs back to life cool yeah so the I'm trying to remember the fam- most famous ones you have. I think the most famous one I'm familiar with is the Brontosaurus, like the original Brontosaurus that yes. became a Potosaurus for a little while. Now, I'm assuming you're going to name it Brontosaurus again? or Yes, of course. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yes, we have uh, Stegosaurus as well. Nice. Which is absolutely adorable. The face on that Stegosaurus is so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Do you still do any fossil preparation or you've got way too much to go with with the conserving part? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, My fossil prep days are gone. Uh, (laughs) We have an amazing team of fossil preparators. They are ah, so amazing. I see their work and my jaw drops constantly. (laughs) They are so talented. So the only prep work I get to do is when I travel back to Uruguay, where I was born and where I did my my undergrad and my master's. And when I go visit the old collection where I used to work in, and they let me play for a little while. <laughs> They're like, here, grab an air scribe. We, we got some work for you to do. <laughs> yeah. But I think I think my work has shifted. So I don't work with air scribes, but I still collaborate with the preparators and we talk about safe ways of mounting things or how are we going to do, for example, the cleaning of the exhibits once we come back. Mm-hmm. Because those are aspects that sometimes are not considered, but you really have to think, how are we going to clean this? How delicate is this fossil mm-hmm. that we're po- putting out in view? Because we really want the public to be able to look at it and enjoy it and be just marveled at both the beauty, but also the science that's coming out of that specimen. And so we, we need, need to, to find ways to keep those exhibits looking beautiful, but also in a way that is safe for the specimens. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. Is there, so it sounds kind of like the research casting part of the renovation is mostly the mounting because you need like big equipment and, you know, all the metal work that they're doing. But on your side, you're doing, you're still doing all of the prep work and the air scribe type stuff in the Yale? The prep work of the skeletons that are in Canada, they are doing. Mm. So they took skeletons and they're doing the prep work because they are also doing the mounting and so they need the bones to Mm -hmm. be able to to design these these giant structures that they're designing so they have the dinosaurs with them we miss them but they'll be back (laughs) (laughs) cool is so are there any spots on like these mounted specimens where you're going to be able to see bone that used to be covered in rock or anything like that so i think the big difference is that for example in the case of the brontosaurus it has so much plaster on it Mm. because that's the way that they used to prepare bones back in the day. Mm -hmm. And what was holding all the vertebrae, you know, you could see that giant neck being held by this 
ginormous beam <laughs> that looks like you know the the Empire State Building being built, one mm-hmm. of those images from the 30s or something. <laughs> it's amazing. And so that giant beam was holding the bones and a lot of things were plastered around beams and metal. Mm. So for research casting to actually take those things down, they had to cut that old plaster. And so finding the real bone is is one aspect that we're really excited that they're going to do. And anything, any reconstruction that they do on those bones is going to look a little bit more sleek, if you must, because it's not covering this giant piece of metal mm-hmm. uh, that it was covering before. So we're really excited also to to see how those bones are going to come back. Gotcha. Yeah. So you're, I'm assuming you're not going to put plaster back onto them. It's going to be like the paraboloid, if I'm saying that right. <laughs> oh, for gluing? Yeah. <laughs> they, they use uh, paraloid V72 uh, a lot of times, which is my adhesive of choice. For a lot of things, not just fossils, but they will have to reconstruct some parts that are missing from the bones. And for that, they're working mostly with the preparators on which materials to use. Mm-hmm. Cool. So going back, you mentioned when you go back home and and sometimes you get to work on and doing the fossil prep. I know you worked at a like a pretty famous site there. That was one of your first jobs. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. That site is absolutely incredible. It's a bone bed that is covered by a stream. The stream is called Arroyo del Vizcaíno, and that's the name of the site. And for you to be able to access the bones, you have to dam the stream and pump out the water. Wow. (laughs) It's intense. The logistics are crazy. It's a Pleistocene site, so it's all megafauna. Mm -hmm. Pleistocene megafauna. And the amount of bones... (laughs) <laughs> There's no place to step on. It's all bone. <laughs> it's marvelous. And there's this sediment that some of them are resting on. And if you take them off that sediment, the side that was touching that sediment is bright orange. I've oh, never seen wow. an orange bone <laughs> in my life. <laughs> and they are this bright orange. And then you take them out and a half hour later, they're dark brown. Wow. So they change color. It's just amazing. And again, the amount of of, of bones is incredible. They're mostly from one species, the Lestodon, which is a ground sloth. Oh, cool. But there are other ones as well. So there are uh, Glyptodons and a saber-toothed cat and a deer and a horse and a mastodon. So there's a little bit of, of, of everything of that Pleistocene megafauna, but it's mostly um, that single species of ground sloth that dominates the, the collection. I knew that when I left, which was in 2014, they had identified 21 individuals of the same uh, ground sloth and then other species on top of that. And they were thousands of bones left to collect oh man wow it's so that's, incredible that's gonna go on for many years then years and years so i will always have a place where i can go play <laughs> <laughs> that's great and you can use the river to do some of the excavation work for you you like damn it well, extract some and then let it go it, again it helps and it doesn't because once you dam the place and you pump out all the water you have to save the fish because mm. they're jumping all over the place. So you try to put them in a bucket and throw them to the other <laughs> side and they don't want to go. So it's it's challenging. But you really want to, them to go because, A, you don't want them to die. And second, you don't want them to die because then they stink at the site. <laughs> <laughs> and it's disgusting. <laughs> but um, it's, there's a lot of mud. And you have to remove all that mud. And every year they put geotextile covering the bones so that all the mud does not deposit on top of the bones again. Mm -hmm. And none of the bones are moved with the stream because in the winter it gets, there's much more water. So there is a possibility for a current to move things. And so they, they put that geotextile. And so you have to also lift the geotextile, which is incredibly heavy when it's (laughs) wet. 
and then you just show all of that and then you just make all the you know the the squares with the string and all of that to to plan how you're going to collect that so there isn't a whole lot of help you get from the stream because you're covering it anyway yes but also a lot of the bones have what are called trampling marks which oh. are some marks that they have on them because at some point the sediment was moved, be likely because other animals were walking on top of it. But there are other marks on them. They're very odd, let's call them. And it has been proposed that uh, they are from human action, which mm. is odd because of the age of the site, which is 30,000 years old. Interesting. So it's, it's very old for down south in south america yeah and so since all these marks are in the bones you cannot use tools to get the bones out oh really so use your hands wow oh man <laughs> i would come back with no nails oh my god after the season <laughs> because it's yeah you have to use you know a little bit of that the, the water the site is never dry because there's come the water coming from beneath mm -hmm. constantly because there's an aquifer over there, so it's never dry. <laughs> so you kind of use a little bit of that to help you move the sediment and get the bones out. So in a way, it helps, but in a way, it doesn't help because if you have something that is extremely delicate, there is no way for you to use plaster, for example. You can't do any of the traditional paleontology <laughs> collecting techniques, none of them. So you just sort of scoop it out then? You try to like scoop it in one bucket? So some of the fossils are rather small that you can just lift. Others you need more than one person because a femur of a grand sloth is huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's all hands on deck. So everybody goes and, you know, together you lift that up. To get, there's no way to take it out with a lot of matrix around it to protect it. So it is a challenging site. And also a lot of those bones are wet. So mm -hmm. when you're, you take them out, they can start to crack. Mm -hmm. So you have to, to find a way to dry them slowly so that you don't find a pile of dust <laughs> afterwards. One of, the, one of the examples that I, I love the most of the things that I worked on is a, the fang of a saber-toothed cat. Mm -hmm. We got it out of the site in three pieces, but... Paraloid is not an adhesive that is easily found in Uruguay. So we had to go to Argentina to get it. It was, it was complicated. So by the time I was able to work on that fang, when I opened it, it was not over 40 fragments. Oh. Wow. Because it had dried. And so that was a very interesting prep work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So how do you try to keep it wet? Do you like put it in a tent with a bunch of moisture and uh, dry it slowly that way? Or what do you do? The smaller bones are easier because normally what the team does is they take it out wet, wet as it is and they put it in a plastic bag that they don't close. And so they put everything in under tent so they're not in the sun. And things are all inside the tent, inside their plastic bags. They're a, a little bit open, hmm. but not too much. But you cannot dry them too slowly because then you get mold. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very interesting, uh, especially when you're collecting so much. Because one year we collected 600 bones. Oh, wow. In two weeks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's a lot. It's incredible. That That's amazing. amazing. So is that the strat? Is it like they every year for a couple of weeks dam the stream and then you just know you'll be back again next year? That is the, the way that they're working because there are farmers around. And so you don't want to disrupt hmm. their work and they their livelihood. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's always arranged that it's, it's normally two weeks during the year. And there may be sometimes a third week or, or another time that you go but more is it's like prospecting around the site so you're not damming the stream and because some people if it's for example it's a very dry year they will use the water from the stream to water their crops mm -hmm. so you can't just dam a stream and leave people without water yeah. for mm -hmm. their beets or whatever they're planting yeah. <laughs> so 
yeah, it's it's a coordinated work. What time of year do you do it? They do it in the summer. So in South America, that is from December to March. Cool. So that's kind of handy because then if you're working in North America, you can do the summer up here and then you can go down there and do the summer and haven't Uruguay. done that yet. <laughs> haven't done that yet. But that would be I mean, they they keep telling me, When are you coming? When are you coming? <laughs> Wait, there's a pandemic going. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully next year. Yeah. Well, you never know. <laughs> It sounds like one of those sites, too, that uh, if you're once you've navigated around that, like you can take on any kind of site. <laughs> it's very intense. But I I imagine what it would be to collect in the desert. And it's such like opposites. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how I would survive in the <laughs> middle of the desert. You go from way too much water to way too little water. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly because the, the advantage of this site is that there is water so if you put some sort of, of of something on top of of where you're digging some of that shade and then the water it's not awful if it's 100 degrees out there mm-hmm. because it's summer but i think in that sense that the desert is, is extremely challenging yeah and especially, yeah, they're trying to use plaster too, so they got to bring a lot of water along for that. Oh, in addition to drinking and yes, different all that. challenges, I suppose. Yeah. Cool. So I have to ask because we do dinosaurs. I know there aren't a lot of dinosaur fossils from Uruguay, but have you had a chance to work on or see any? Seen, yes, I've seen dinosaur eggs and some fragments, mostly from like lung bones or vertebrae. Those are more common and then there are some carnivore teeth so there aren't there aren't many many dinosaurs in uruguay it's like argentina and brazil had all the amazing yeah. <laughs> geology and then it just flattens and becomes these teeny tiny little thing when it gets to uruguay <laughs> but the counter side to that is that if you look at the geologic map of uruguay it's incredibly diverse you have things from the whole geologic time in that teeny tiny little territory. (laughs) Cool. So, yeah, well, we don't have dinosaurs, but we have the whole thing. (laughs) So it's amazing. (laughs) Yeah. So there are incredibly old rocks. So even though we're not lucky enough to have ginormous skeletons of sauropods like our neighbors, we are very lucky to have amazing outcrops of, of other things. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it seems like you could find something eventually there, right? Because you do have the Cretaceous rock, or is it not the right type of rock? Yeah. <laughs> it's not the best. <laughs> and again, it, most of the things that are found are not very big. Mm. Like, And also the sauropods that we get to find, they are so solidified. It's so hard to tell what's what. So it is it is challenging, but we do have footprints. That's good. Mm-hmm. We have some tracks. Yeah. So those are cool. For our listeners, where's the best place for them to go to find out more about you and your work? Probably online. Yes. I'm very active both on Twitter and Instagram. So did you know that Twitter only has 15 characters for your name? And my name is 16. Oh, oh. so close. So close. Again. <laughs> Um, I had to drop a letter. <laughs> so it's still in English. It still sounds Mariana Di Giacomo. It's just that the I and the D had to be dropped. Mm-hmm. So I am at Mariana Di Giacomo. And on Instagram, I'm at Maru DG, M A R U D I G I. Great. Yeah. And there's talking a bit earlier before the recording you've been posting a lot of amazing photos of what's going on at the peabody right now which has been cool to see yeah and i also have my my website which is www.marianadigiacomo.com which is uh mostly i have my my instagram feed and all that but there's also contact if anybody wants to ever ask me any questions i'm i'm reachable through there (laughs) cool awesome nice well thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us that was really interesting. I had no idea we were going to go down and learn about extracting fossils from Uruguay and a river. That's amazing. (laughs) You never know where these things are going to take you. Exactly. (laughs) That's the beauty of these conversations. (laughs) 
Well, yeah, thanks so much for, for taking the time to chat with us. And thank you for having me. Thanks again, Mariana. We can't wait to see what this new and improved and massive new Yale Peabody Museum looks like. Yes, and I also really want to see the mural. Since we've never been there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Cetiosaurus, which was a request from Paul via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. I like how you really emphasize the T in it. I always just say Cetiosaurus. You're like, Cetiosaurus. Oh, I didn't even <laughs> notice. <laughs> so Cetiosaurus or Cetiosaurus was a sauropod that lived in the Middle Jurassic and what is now Europe in England, France, Switzerland, Morocco, which isn't Europe, but some of those specimens have since, actually most of those specimens have since been reassigned to different genera. Cetiosaurus is different from another sauropod, Cetiosauriscus, which also lived in the middle Jurassic and what is now England. So it's a little confusing. That's very confusing. But Cetiosaurus, anyway, it looks like other sauropods. It was quadrupedal, it had the long neck and the small head. And Cetiosaurus oxoniensis, which is the type species as of 2014. I'll get into the history in a little bit. It's estimated to be 52 feet or 16 meters long and weigh 11 tons. Cetiosaurus had a shorter tail and neck than most sauropods. Its tail had at least 40 caudal vertebrae. And it had relatively long forelimbs. The forelimb was about the same length as the hind limb. The dorsal vertebrae in the back were heavy. They weren't hollow like other sauropods, such as Brachiosaurus. And being a sauropod, you might have guessed it was an herbivore. Based on its neck length and limb proportions, Cetiosaurus probably was a generalist feeder, eating vegetation at low and medium high levels. And it lived in an area with floodplains and open woodland. So Cetiosaurus was a wastebasket taxon. There were 18 species named. And now only one is considered to be valid. That's Cetiosaurus oxoniensis. And as I mentioned, Cetiosaurus oxoniensis became the type species in 2014, and that one is based on multiple specimens. That includes most of the bones, but not much of the skull, although possibly a brain case. The genus name, Cetiosaurus, means whale lizard. Uh, I thought that might be Cetio. That's probably why there's the other Cetiosauriscus, too, because they're so big. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, this must be a whale. Or if they find the vertebrae first, then it becomes a whale. Yes. And also being found so early before we knew much about dinosaurs. So Cetiosaurus was described in 1841 by Richard Owen, who originally thought it was a large marine animal, maybe a whale, maybe a crocodile. And he named Cetiosaurus just before he coined the term dinosauria. But he thought it was a large marine animal, so that's why it's not one of the original dinosaurs. Oh, interesting. The species name Oxoniensis refers to Oxford. So John Kingdon had reported the first fossils of Cetiosaurus that were found in Chipping Norton, England, in a letter that was read in 1825 to the Geological Society, and then Owen named the animal. And Cetiosaurus was first described based on caudal vertebrae, limb elements, and a partial shoulder girdle. So without knowing much about dinosaurs and without knowing anything about sauropods, I could see how it'd be hard to piece together what it would look like. Mostly what they knew back then was that it was a giant. At least the things they knew that were right. <laughs> yeah. And Richard Owen said that its bones were much bigger than an elephant's or a megalosaurus, and that only iguanodon and whales were similar in size. There's a quote from the Proceedings of the Geological Society of London in 1842 that says, quote, as there is no known extinct saurian which can so nearly compete in size with the Cetiosaurus as the Iguanodon, it is fortunate Professor Owen observes that the distinguishing characters are so well marked and easily recognizable, End quote. Just found that one interesting now that we know more. Yeah, it's interesting that he didn't think it was a dinosaur, but compares it to Iguanodon. Mm-hmm. That's probably because Richard Owen thought the limb bones were like crocodiles and the vertebrae were like whales. He also thought Cetiosaurus was carnivorous. <laughs> like those early sauropod depictions where they're carnivorous. Yes. Although, so Mark Witten has a fun whale-like version of Cetiosaurus based on Richard Owen's description. And thank you to our patron Morgan for the link. It's got this long tail, a big middle and strong jaws. 
and just looks so different from mm. how <laughs> we know Cetiosaurus looks now. Well, presumably without the skull, if you're just basing what the head might be like mm -hmm. on the vertebrae and things, you'd never expect it to have this little puny head at the end. It's true. <laughs> uh, later, Richard Owen did classify Cetiosaurus as a crocodilian. And then in 1842, he named two additional species, Cetiosaurus hypoolithicus and Cetiosaurus epiolithicus, based on fossils found in Yorkshire. And then that same year, he named four more species. Oh, jeez. There's Cetiosaurus brevis, the short one, Cetiosaurus brachyurus, the short-tailed, Cetiosaurus medius, the medium size, and Cetiosaurus longus, the long one. Take it easy with the Cetiosaurus. It's too many Cetiosaurus. <laughs> well, when he was naming those four new ones, he used the fossils from the Cetiosaurus Hypoolithicus and Cetiosaurus epiolithicus, so they stopped using those two names at least. So that does add to some of the confusion because he named the two species Cetiosaurus hypoolithicus and Cetiosaurus epiolithicus first, but then when he named the four additional species, he stopped using those two names because he used the fossils from those two species to name his other four species. Oh, so those two got like reinterpreted into the other four names? Yes. Oh, weird. And then in 1849, it was found that some of those fossils were from Iguanodon today. <laughs> Speaking of Iguanodon. <laughs> yeah. So Alexander Melville in 1849 named the fossils that were from sauropods, from which turned out to be from Cetiosaurus brevis, as Cetiosaurus coneybearii, but then that didn't really make sense. It just made Cetiosaurus coneybearii a junior synonym of Cetiosaurus brevis. Yeah. But this was before the ICZN, and I guess it sounds like Richard Owen was doing similar stuff, renaming his own species to new species, too. It's a good point. Uh, Richard Owen thought that Cetiosaurus was a crocodile as late as 1859. And then they figured out that it was a dinosaur, presumably? Thomas Huxley said it was a dinosaur in 1869. Oh, nice. There was a right femur of Cetiosaurus oxoniensis found in 1868 by workers, and then Professor John Phillips excavated from 1869 to 1870 and found three skeletons. Uh, and those filled in the missing pieces that made it obviously a dinosaur rather than a whale or a crocodile. Hmm. So Phillips named two species in 1871. There's Cetiosaurus oxoniensis and Cetiosaurus glyptonensis. And then in 1871, he also suggested that Cetiosaurus was an herbivorous dinosaur in a monograph. Twist. Yeah. So it changed a lot in those 30-ish years. And in 1875, Richard Owen said Cetiosaurus was a large aquatic dinosaur. So he came around to the dinosaur part. Yeah, and that was par for the course that these huge animals couldn't live on land, at least. I think that was well into the 20th century when people started really fully coming around on them being terrestrial. Mm -hmm. Then after 1875, there's not too much on Cetiosaurus until 1968 when a new Cetiosaurus oxoniensis specimen was found, and that one's called the Rutland dinosaur, and was found by somebody who was driving an excavation vehicle at the base of the Rutland formation in England. And this Rutland dinosaur is the most complete sauropod found in the UK, which is why sometimes you might hear people say Cetiosaurus is the most complete sauropod in the UK. Cool. It's about 40% complete, and it includes most of the cervical bones, most of the dorsal vertebrae, part of the sacrum and anterior caudals, chevrons, ilium, right femur, and rib and limb, f and rib and limb fragments. So no skull. Yes. It's about 49 feet or 15 meters long, and since 1985 has been on display in the Leicester Museum and Art Gallery. And if you're trying to find the Rutland dinosaur and you're Googling Lester, it's spelled L-E-I-C-E-S-T-E-R, which is not how I would spell Lester. Yes. Well, as an American, yes. <laughs> That's true. If you live near there, you might know how to spell it, I suppose. So Cetiosaurus, again, was a wastebasket taxon. Thirteen species of Cetiosaurus have been named on fossils that were found in England, three from France, one from Morocco, and one from Switzerland. That is a lot of species. Yes. Well, what made this very confusing was that Richard Owen initially named Cetiosaurus without n giving it a species name. <laughs> it's just a genus. Yeah. That's how most people talk about dinosaurs. Who needs the species name? But then you name 18 types of species <laughs> and it gets very confusing. That's true. <laughs> 
So Cetiosaurus medius was traditionally considered to be the type species of Cetiosaurus. And Richard Owen did say so shortly after naming it in an 1842 article. Richard Lidecker assigned Cetiosaurus oxoniensis as the type species in 1888, but by modern rules of the ICZN, the original author, Richard Owen, is the one who would select the type species. In 2003 and 2009, Paul Upchurch and John Martin looked through all the species of Cetiosaurus and found most of them to be invalid because a lot of them were based on fragmentary material. Yeah, where at the time they seemed unique, but now that we've found so many more sauropods, we look at it and we're like, that's just not, it's not enough. enough. Yeah. <laughs> they also found some of the species to be valid dinosaurs, but they were just different types of dinosaurs, not sauropods. <laughs> Interesting. Or maybe some were sauropods, but yeah, just not Cetiosaurs. Which is kind of funny because in 1905, there was a paper on parts of the skeleton Cetiosaurus leads eye. And it was a new specimen found near Petersboro that said, quote, This specimen is so well preserved that since its acquisition by the British Museum, it has been possible to mount the various bones on ironwork in their natural position. And there was a chain of 10 small vertebrae. And they said, quote, A chain of such vertebrae at the end of so massive an animal as Cetiosaurus must have been especially liable to accident. I mean, I just like that second quote about being liable to accident. Mm -hmm. But the main thing here was that they thought it was so well preserved and, you know, they could mount it so easily. But in 2003, Paul Upchurch and John Martin found that there was nothing diagnostic in that species. And they found that that species was a gnomum dubium. So back then, a amazing specimen from 1905 became a not even very useful specimen in 2003. Mm-hmm. So Upchurch and Martin proposed to the ICZN to change the type species from Cetiosaurus medius because they found medius to be invalid due to the fossils not being distinct enough to become Cetiosaurus oxoniensis. And they found five atapomorphies of Cetiosaurus oxoniensis, including having these quote-unquote pyramid-shaped neural spines in the dorsal vertebrae. And the ICZN accepted the proposal in 2014, which is why, as of 2014, the type species is Cetiosaurus oxoniensis. So Upchurch and Martin proposed that the Rutland dinosaur be the lectotype for Cetiosaurus oxoniensis, which makes sense, the most complete one. Scientists have suggested Cetiosaurus to be closely related to neosauropods, so Cetiosaurus may help show the origins of neosauropods. You can see a Cetiosaurus statue at Edaville Family Theme Park in Massachusetts, (laughs) and there are Cetiosaurus fossils in the collections at the Museum of Gloucester. Nice. I don't know if we have that one on our map. I'm going to have to double check. And as promised, since it's World Metrology Day, or at least it is the day after this episode comes out. I've got some measurement-tastic fun facts to go through. All right. Yeah. Meters in particular are great, which is why we include them in almost all of our measurements, even though we're based in the U.S., because eventually the U.S. is going to get around to the metric system. We sort of do already, but not. we're not really in it yet. I think we almost did once. We almost did a couple times. I think in the 1994 or something, there was a new law that said you have to write the metric components on most things, which is why like soda bottles have the fluid ounces and the milliliters on them. So maybe people will get used to it eventually and then we can switch over. But in the meantime, it has been getting more common. And when I started my engineering degree 15 years ago, we only used SI units because the math is much easier, which is nice because... It gets crazy if you try to use Fahrenheit and all these things when you're doing engineering. Yeah, it's terrible. I don't know how anybody ever accomplished that. How about Kelvin? Kelvin is fantastic. That's the SI version. Oh, what was I thinking? Maybe ranking? Could be. That's like the American version of Kelvin. Basically, zero is absolute zero, but it scales all weird. Anyway, I digress. So 2021's theme for World Metrology Day is measurement for health. And just like all the useful ways and types of measurements you can do to keep track of health, I came up with a few dinosaur examples. So the first category is length, which is in the metric system measured in meters or in derived units like millimeters, square centimeters, or liters. Those are all just derivations of the meter. A liter is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, in case you didn't know. Most papers have 
tons of links listed when it comes to paleontology. It seems like that's the unit everything is in, is in centimeters, meters, millimeters. They're used for the sizes of bones. They're used for individual features. They use ratios of lengths all over the place for different species. And it's, it's just a super useful unit. One of the ways you can use it for health is the femur or humerus cross-sectional area or the circumference can tell you roughly how much the animal weighed. And then potentially, I suppose, you could figure out if it was underweight if you're thinking about it in a health context. You could also look at the depth or width of pits, which are caused by pathologies. Obviously, we'll tell you how injured the animal is. And you can look at the volume of tumors. Oh. <laughs> Another way you can use length in dinosaur health, as well as lots of other uses for length because it's pretty ubiquitous. There's also one that's sort of not the most interesting metric because it's essentially discrete counts of things or counts per area which are just measured in number or number per area. So, for example, the number of legs in a bone can tell you how old an animal got or if it died prematurely. You can also look at the number of pathologies on bones, which will tell you if it was infected or sick and potentially how infected it was compared to other similar dinosaurs, how much a disease had spread, things like that. And you can look at in some cases, the count or density of parasites, like those worms in a titanosaur toe bone we talked about recently, where they were like in the blood vessels. Mm. It was very intense and yep, super gross. Yep, I remember gross. that one. But yeah, there were a lot. There was a high density of those parasites, so that dinosaur was probably having a rough time. And then one last category I came up with for metrology of dinosaur health is the composition chemically of the dinosaur bones which is obviously more difficult to measure accurately and a little bit less connected to the health potentially than some of the other measures. Technically, it's a count of particles, but usually the unit that we're talking about here is moles or a ratio of moles. And if you remember from chemistry, moles from Avogadro's number are a count of atoms. So we're not talking about weight or anything like that. We're talking about individual atoms at this point but it's useful when you're doing ratios because you can talk about moles of one thing divided by moles of another thing the main way this comes up when it comes to health is with a paleothermometer where we can actually measure the temperature of an extinct animal from their fossil based on ratios of oxygen isotopes in the bones by using molar ratios in that way so to sum up we can estimate animal size weight and temperature by using these different metrology techniques but we can't estimate way more things i was thinking about like all the stuff you get done on your physical the first thing they do is they check your height and weight <laughs> and your temperature but they also often check like your blood oxygen saturation and your blood pressure and then if they're doing any kind of blood analysis they'll look at like platelet count all that kind of stuff and you can't do any of those things any of the things that rely on a liquid measurement just goes away too quickly from the soft tissue that doesn't fossilize. Just to emphasize how useful having a universal system of measurement is, since that's really what World Metrology Day is all about, I have a couple dinosaur measurements in unusual units. Of course. I, I always like to do this on World Metrology Day. Maybe I've only done it one other time. I don't remember you doing this before. I did lengths, and I was talking about like hands for like measuring the length of dinosaurs. And you've called out World Metrology Day before? I did, yes. Huh. <laughs> I plan on doing it every year if I remember because I love World Metrology Day. There's so many fun ways to measure dinosaurs. But this time I want to talk about the time since dinosaurs went extinct. So in non-SI units, dinosaurs went extinct 0.29 galactic years ago. A galactic year is how long it takes us, or more specifically the sun, to orbit the center of our galaxy so they're a little more than a quarter revolution of the galaxy ago that dinosaurs went extinct. Hmm. You could also express that as 270 Pluto kilo annum ago. That's how many times Pluto orbited? The sun, yeah. Or at 66 Earth mega annum ago. That's the one we're used to. Mm -hmm. Or just for fun, 1.7 giga fortnights ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so 1.7 billion times 14 days and as a fun like cocktail party aside a micro fortnight or one millionth of 14 days is 1.2096 seconds 
I wonder how often this would come up at a cocktail party. People use it as like a fun joke, like rather than saying seconds, mm -hmm. you say micro fortnights. Oh. So you'd be like, I'll be back in like 30 micro fortnights. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I really like it. It's the kind of jokes I enjoy. <laughs> And then if you want to do it in SI, it's 2.1 petaseconds ago, or 2.1 quadrillion seconds is 66 million years. So I think of all these, the galactic year is probably the closest one to the geological time scale, where you don't have to use crazy huge like giga and mega prefixes to go with it. And if you use the galactic year, the Mesozoic lasted from 1.1 to 0 0.29 galactic years ago, which means that non-avian dinosaurs as a group almost made a full revolution around the galaxy. Such a successful group. It really was. But if you include birds into the group of dinosaurs, then they have made it all the way around. Because a galactic year takes 230 million years, and the oldest dinosaur fossils are about 240 million years old. So they did it. Hmm. Pretty impressive. Just for context, humans have been around for about 0 0.001 galactic years, or one milligalactic year. That's a much shorter amount. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a hard one to use day to day, because a day is about 12 picogalactic years. But when we're talking about paleontology, it's not so bad. If you remember, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which is why World Metrology Day is so important, because we <laughs> all just use the same year, and then it's so easy to talk across all these boundaries. There isn't one group that's using these crazy galactic years and somebody else using Giga Fortnites. Or Pluto Kilo Annum. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a weird one to choose. Yeah. I was trying to find them that went like Kilo, Mega, Giga, all the way up. To peta, but there isn't an easy one in between Giga Fortnites and Peta Seconds. There's well, no good Terra one. Well, there you go. <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And also, I just want to mention the Apple Podcast app got updated, and so it's not showing the links to any of our stuff, and a lot of other apps also don't show it. So if you want to see the links to all of the news stories we mentioned in this episode, and a bullet list of all the details about the dinosaur of the day that Sabrina went through, then you can go to inodino.com and that has the full list. And also, if you subscribe to our newsletter, then we'll email you that list of links and details every week when the show comes out. Thanks again, and until next time. Goodbye.